Hey, this is Dan from Music Explorer. In part one with Chuck Berge, we talked about his influences, pasty symbols, hanging out with Joe Walsh when he was a kid, and his high school friend, guitarist Al Anderson of Bob Marley's band. In part two, we discuss his breakthrough in pro drumming with Al Delmiola, Brand X, Paul and Oates, Rainbow, and his new band, Tokyo Motor Fist. It was your first taste of getting somewhere with a band in 1978? It was actually 77. It took me seven years out of high school to be earning good, consistent money, and it was touring with Al Dimiola. I think it was his first solo album. And then after that, I joined Brand X. The cool thing is you replaced Phil Collins. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't replace Phil, but I was given the opportunity to really be me as if I was Phil, you know? I mean, I never looked at it like, oh, I'm yep, <laughs> I'm Phil's spot now, because uh, he's one of my favorite drummers and a sweet, sweet guy. But that band, Brand X, just happened to be, you know, in the top three or four bands that I listened to. And, and when the opportunity came to audition for them, I jumped at it. It was magic, man. It was a big, huge time in my life. Brand X did everything from big clubs, small theaters, big theaters, and we actually opened up for Genesis. A year later, after I left the band, I was up in Canada working with some fusion players, and we opened up for Brand X. I got a chance to listen to Phil having to play stuff I played on, and Phil didn't play double bass, but I used double bass on the album that I did. So he made do, and of course they felt they had to play some of those songs, but it was, a, it was a really fun moment to kind of go full circle, see him trying to play my stuff, and then opening up for them with a bunch of original stuff, which was also, it was an amazing band. So then after Brand X, you wound up in Hall & Oates. Complete 180. I had been going full bore with very busy, very odd time stuff. I kind of got sick of it. I got sick of all the guys in the crowd. You know, when I grew up in, in high school, we used to have lots of girls in the audience, amazing. And it was a wonderful changeover from being a jazz rocker or being known as that to, I can play rock, I can play pop again. How did you get in Rainbow after Bobby Rondinelli left? He called me and said, you want to audition for Rainbow? And I said, yes. And I went and played with them and, uh, for some reason, Richie was in a very foul mood that day. He didn't even say goodbye after the rehearsal. Just kind of... But Roger came up to me and was like, hey, I'm going to do a solo record. Would you like to play on it? And I was like, yeah. So I started working with Roger, and they eventually went off to Copenhagen to record Then Out of Shape. So I got a crazy call from Joe and Roger one night. Get on a plane, bring your gear and we'll see you uh, here in Copenhagen in two days. When he formed Rainbow again, you got jumped right back in. That was 90, 95, yeah. yeah. I was, right. It was crazy. I was the only, I think the only drummer of all the Rainbow incarnations to be asked back a second time. I didn't do the album. A guy named John O'Reilly, great right. player, did the record. But uh, it just worked out. I had been with Blue Oyster Cult for a bunch of years and really wanted more out of the business than they were willing to give me. So when Richie called, it was like, dude, I'm there. Richie said he liked Foreigner's sound, and that's where he wanted to aim towards that kind of sound. The album I was on ended up being probably the closest to a Foreigner type of record with uh, Street of Dreams, which really was probably the biggest radio hit he had ever had. I think there was nothing wrong with that. It was just, wasn't the Ronnie James vibe as much. By the time I joined them, they had two albums with Joe Lynn already done and out. So we had more than enough material, but most of the time it was from then out of shape, uh, straight between the eyes and difficult to cure. So it was a more current sounding band because we didn't reach back to the, the early rainbow days uh, as much. We had so many Extraordinary times on stage with that band, uh, my God. In Sweden, something was plaguing his amplifier situation and he threw a beer bottle through the scrim. And then next thing I know, they were pulling the, the whole truss down and screaming because we never went back on. And I was like, well, what do we do now? And I remember the road manager was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> really? We're leaving? He was like, yeah, it's over. They're pulling, you know, they're, they're wrecking the stage. I definitely want to talk about Tokyo Motor Fist. We can go from Rainbow to <laughs> Tokyo Motor Fist for a minute because Shazam, suddenly Greg Smith and I are playing together again. 
so much of it was already sculpted by uh, the maestro Steve Brown, but we've been in that group to participate in both albums and to also do it live, most recently on the Monsters of Rock cruise in March. We wouldn't have been able to keep it together if we all didn't really want to be doing not only the type of music that Steve composes, but that type of music. It's what I grew up really loving. I think the new Tokyo Motor Fist albums put a bit more of a modern slant on it, but we have a classic sound that goes back to it's like 80s-ish. And that was intentional uh, before I ever joined the band. I think it was intentional on Steve's part because that's the love of the frontiers, our 80s music guys. And um, from what I've been able to understand, they wanted bands that emulated or, or, or had that vibe about them. 